Well, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started with our adult Sunday school class. We are continuing through our series, talking through what we mean by specific terms and how we find um, these things to be true in Scripture. So would you bow your heads with me as we pray before we start our Sunday school lesson today? Lord, we thank you for your word, that it is sufficient, it is all we need for life and godliness, and we ask, Lord, that you would help us to be humble and teachable students of your word, that we would seek to be diligent in our study, that we would seek to apply what you say in your word, what you command and instruct for us, and that we would seek to live according to it, knowing that there is joy and delight in your ways. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and grace to us through our Lord Jesus Christ, and pray that he would be glorified today. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're going to continue our series, and today we are talking about what we mean by the phrase or the term elder-led. Really our outline for today is to talk through what we mean by this term church polity, and who is in charge of the church, where authority is delegated to by Christ himself. We also want to talk through biblical principles. What does scripture say about the governance of his church And also, thirdly, we're going to talk practically about what this looks like here at Redemption Hill Church, because I think a lot of times church governance, how the church is run, is something that's under-talked about, and it's not necessarily in your personal Bible study that you go through and ask that question. And so it's important for us as a church, if we are to run and operate in a way that glorifies Christ, um, we want to make sure that we understand what Scripture says about it. So I'm excited to get to talk through this together this morning. So first, let's talk about understanding church polity. Really, church polity is really seeking to answer the question, how should the church be governed? And there's lots of assumptions we kind of bring to the table. We have our own church experience. We have experiences from other walks of life of how things are operated, where authority lies. And so sometimes we just kind of import those things. We think, well, maybe the church is sort of set up like a monarchy where there's one person with all authority in charge. Or maybe it's an aristocracy where there's a group in charge. Or maybe it's a democracy. Everybody... Um, it has a vote, everybody's in charge, and we, we do simply what the majority wants, or maybe we have experience from our government, it's more of a democratic republic, or it's run like a corporation, a family, a husband and wife. We have all these structures, and so sometimes we just think, well, the church is kind of like those, or we even assume that it's primarily one of those. And I think it's helpful for us to think about, really, we have a lot of those, those structures established, even in Scripture, but we ought to think about what does Christ say about his church specifically and how it should be governed. And really, it's, it's coming together with a little bit of a mixture of these, as we will find as we look today. But there's really, currently, there's three common views of church polity, and um, they're found pre- predominantly in different denominations and how those churches operate. And I wanted for us to start out really saying, how have faithful Christians for years tried to understand church polity from Scripture, and what does that look like today currently? Because some of it's just helpful understanding the terminology um, when you're talking with other believers and other people from other churches. What, what is their authority structure as well? So I want to start with talking about these three views. And the first one uh, that is commonly known is called Episcopalian or Episcopalianism. And this is really governance by a bishop. So they look at scripture, they see the term overseer, episkopos, or this word for bishop, and they see that that is designated in scripture as an authoritative position. They see the the office of bishop as a, a distinct office that's separate from one that is a pastor or an elder that they also find in scripture. So because this office is distinct, they see it as superior and set above those that are officers maybe of a local church. And the bishop is one who has authority to ordain and govern over local leaders, such as priests, or also known as rectors. And this likely reminds you of what you would find in a Roman Catholic church. But Protestant churches also can um, have, have this sort of governance view implemented. You uh, heard of the Anglican Church. They have an Episcopalian view of governance. The Episcopalian Church in the U.S. also holds to that. The United Methodist Church and even some Lutheran practice, some Lutherans practice a version of this sort of church model for governance as well. So Episcopalian is one of the polity positions you'll find amongst Christians. There's also a second one, a second church polity view called Presbyterianism. And to hold to a Presbyterian view is a a governance by elders. It's a governance by elders. And this view is more of a representative form of church government. 
Um, and that's what we mean by that is that there are congregational members who, who call a, a pastor, elder, to be part of the session, the group of elders that, that um, has authority over that local church. And the presbytery um, confirms those callings um, and appoints those as elders in those sessions. So many of you are familiar with this, but a, a local church is ruled by a session, which is a group of elders chosen by the congregation and approved by the presbytery above them. Members of different local sessions also serve as members of a presbytery, which is a, a higher governance group, which has ruling authority over a region. And then there are several members of each presbytery that serve in what's called the General Assembly, which governs the entire denomination of that church denomination. So this view um, really sees the difference between Episcopalian and Presbyterian is uh, um, in Episcopalian, the bishop is a superior office and that office of bishop overseer. But with Presbyterians, they see in Scripture, really there's a synonymous relationship between overseer or bishop and elder. They see those as one in the same role. And so rather than separating those groups, they put them together and try to almost basket interweave that authority with that hierarchical, hierarchical structure. But they would distinguish between um, ruling elders and teaching elders within their sessions um, in each church. And in this view, the congregation is involved only in the process of bringing on elders. But the elders' decision is the decision of the entire church. That's why it's representing the church. Hence, there's no further confirmation uh, from the congregation that is necessary other than calling the elders to be part of the session. So the third common view that you'll find in church polity is called congregationalism. It is a congregational view of church polity. And there are some who hold this position that see the congregation itself as those who rule over and make every decision of the church. It's sort of a purely democratic rule that has become common in many churches throughout America, I think primarily through suspicion of authority. But initially, congregational, uh, this congregational view of government was local governance in each local church by shepherding elders. That's what was distinguishing um, this mark of congregationalism from either an Episcopalian or Presbyterian view. Um, it was basically initially started because it, not that the people would rule, but that authority to rule is delegated by Christ to each local congregation in the shepherding elder in the church. So rather than having a, an earthly sort of uh, ecclesiastical structure um, amongst other um, far authorities that aren't locally in the church. This view sees church polity established as a local governing that is under Christ's direct rule. And that the absolute rule of Christ is administered through the pastor elders given to lead his people. So they see the structure more as there's a pastor or a plurality of pastors. There are deacons that help serve the needs of the church that are underneath those pastors called to lead. And then there is the congregation. But the, the inner basket weaving, you could say, um, is seen in that the congregation calls deacons and the congregation calls pastors as well. So there's an involvement from the church standpoint as well. So this view also sees some synonymous terms in Scripture. But more than Presbyterians seeing the overseer and the elder, they would say there's this, this term of shepherd or pastor that also is synonymous in Scripture. And so they see all of that as operating as the leadership structure and describing a singular, a singular office within church governance. So um, they'll take this uh, these passages of Scripture, and they'll seek to say, okay, this one office is, is tasked with the responsibility to feed and to lead the flock. They are tasked to teach, to protect, and to steward the flock of God as assigned to them locally in their congregation. So they do this, um, those that hold this view, with the assistance of the deacons. Uh, their their uh, office is established in the book of Acts, as we'll see today, and they're to be problem solvers and uh, people servers. And both the office of pastor and deacon have qualifications established in Scripture that are to be recognized and affirmed by the congregation. So these, uh, the two primary views that can be distinguished within congregationalism would be either a single pastor congregationalism. So this would be set up as a senior pastor who has um, assistant pastors underneath his specific authority. Or there's a plurality of pastors view where um, there is um, associate pastors who are all um, sharing the same authority, but even if there's differing gifts amongst the plurality of pastors. So those would be two subsets of congregationalism, either the singular pastor, senior pastor model, or a plurality of pastors 
model. So having reviews these, reviewed these three um, options of how saints have sought to understand what Scripture says about the authority within Christ's church and that he's established, I think it's helpful to chart them out and to really see some of their commonalities and distinctions and to see what, what are believers wrestling with and how do we seek to answer that biblically from texts of Scripture. So I wanted to chart this out for us and really look at the Episcopalian, the Presbyterian, the single pastor congregational, and the plural pastor congregational view. So if you have it set up visually in front of you with this chart, um, you could split it down the middle vertically and say that really they're trying to identify uh, where, what is the quantity of leaders with authority established by Christ. So the Episcopalian and the single pastor congregation are saying there is a singular authority either with a hierarchical structure like Episcopalian or there is a singular local authority that is established by Christ, whereas the other views are really trying to say there's a shared authority. Presbyterians are saying there's, there seems to be a plurality emphasized in Scripture amongst the elders that have this shared authority, and they have that tiered up into different um, sessions and presbyteries and general uh, assemblies. But the plural pastor congregation just says there's, there's a local plural group of leaders. So we can see it identified in a quantity of leaders. that That's what they're wrestling with as a question. What does Scripture say? Is it singular or is it plural? Is it shared or is it a, a solo role? And then also they're trying to wrestle with, if you split it horizontally, they're trying to say, how do churches relate to one another? What is the level of relationship between local churches here on earth? And, and if you look at the Episcopalian and Presbyterian view, they see a sort of interdependent view of the church. They're saying local churches should have a connection, not just um, in their mission and in their relation to Christ, but in their governing authority. They should be submitted to a, a local, uh, visible authority here on earth. And then the congregational view, rather, says, no, not interdependent, that there would be rather an independent view of local churches, that Christ directly delegates authority to local pastors and churches, and that really they're not independent as in um, we're not a part of them at all, but rather independent saying there's not governing authority outside the local church that is in between Christ and the elders that are appointed and called by the congregation. So to answer these questions, we really want to look at texts of Scripture and in regards to answering the first question about what does Scripture say about the quantity of leaders, I find that Scripture is, is, has a, a high frequency um, in regards to the plurality of an eldership throughout Scripture. So especially in the New Testament regarding the church and this position of elder, um, most of the times you see a singular use of the term elder. It's referring to a specific elder, John the elder, or um, Peter the elder. They're talking about a specific person. But when they're talking about church polity or even addressing a group or addressing a singular church, it's always elders, plural. Let me give you some examples. Acts 14, 23, um, during Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey, they're heading back through, and he says that um, when they came back through, they appointed elders, plural, for them, referring to the disciples, in every church. In every singular church, it's saying, and that's not a plural church, not in every, all the church is plural, but rather elders, plural, in church, singular. And that they did this with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they have believed. Titus, also one of the pastoral epistles in chapter 1, verse 5, uh, Paul's writing to Titus, and he says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders, plural, in every town, singular, as I directed you. So again, there's this, this, this pattern of elders, plural, a singular location. James 5.14 instructs church members, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders, plural, of the church, singular, and let them pray over him. So it seems like there's instructions for church members that they should be calling a plurality of elders. There's church planning instructions about putting multiple elders in one location uh, multiple times in passages of Scripture. So it seems like we would, we would fall under, um, according to these passages, we would fall under a, a quantity of leadership. We would answer that as shared. It should be a plurality, ideally, for the church. And so that puts us on uh, what would be the right side of this, this chart. So then we have to answer, what does Scripture tend to say about this view of independent versus interdependent? Uh, well, independent, what, what we mean by that term is that there's no governing authority in the visible church on earth with jurisdiction over local churches. A local church is directly accountable to Christ and his word, independent of all earthly church authority. So it doesn't mean that these churches are independent of Christ's authority. It doesn't mean that, uh, but it does imply that there still ought to be, according to scripture, a close communion with other churches. 
that this, this relationship with other churches is, is united in Christ himself. So that, that means it's not pointless. It's just saying that there's not a governing authority that Christ has established and instructed in Scripture for how local churches ought to be connected. There's no authority connection there is um, uh, apart from Christ himself. So uh, it seems like um, when you really look at this subject in Scripture, it's really one of those... Um, it seems most clear to be independent rather than interdependent. And the reason for that is really a, an argument from absence, which seems like a, an, an unclear or, or an unstrong argument. But when you're arguing against a position that isn't present in Scripture, you kind of just have to say it's not there. Um, and then there's specific passages that they'll look at. But to give you one example, um, and really you'll see this as, and ring true in your own Bible study and reading, there's always an emphasis on the relationship between the pastoral authority and the personal flock that he is assigned. There's always a personal relationship in regards to that authority. And to give you an example, be 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13 says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you. There's a, a local sort of laboring that you are to respect these that are in charge of your soul care. Those who, he says, are over you in the Lord and who admonish you personally. And to esteem them very highly in love because of their work, referring to this shepherding elders um, at that church. So it seems like scripture emphasizes local authority and doesn't establish for us this sort of distant authority that governs over multiple local churches. This idea of interconnected authority is different than intercommunion that is directly through Christ that we also we do see described in scripture. So hopefully that establishes for us a little bit of just kind of a landing pad. Okay, it seems like we're under the shared um, we're answering shared in regards to scripture, and we're answering independent in regards to scripture. So that really hones in on this idea of a plural pastor congregational church polity. Which, again, because there's confusion on the term congregational, um, there's some who see that as, well, the congregation runs the church rather than it's independent and um, from, from other governing authorities um, here on earth. Um, we tend to try to be specific with our terminology of what Scripture says and describe it rather than just tack a term on it. So today I want to look at scriptural passages that, that are going to coincide with this view of a plural pastor congregational polity model. And ultimately that is our source. Ultimately we want to be um, rigorous in our study of Scripture to say we want to be consistent with what Christ tells us to do because this is His church and we want to honor Him in all that we do. So we need to know what the Bible says about roles and responsibilities, both of those who lead the church and those who are members of the church, and how they're supposed to relate to each other. So the best place to start for us in this study is really looking through the book of Acts. We see in the Gospels that Christ has come, he's become incarnate, he's lived the perfect life, died and rose again to purchase for himself a bride, to purchase for himself the church. And he says then in the book of Acts to, to go and spread the gospel and the church is being established and grown throughout this book. So this book of Acts we see as a transitional book. It's the start of something new and we ought to see that clear through um, observations on a broad brush scale of scripture in the book of Acts specifically. So if we looked at a timeline so to speak of Acts, we would start it with saying at the beginning Christ who has all authority delegates that authority to apostles. His 12 apostles have the authority, they are preaching and teaching and they are, are ruling over the, the church that is growing by thousands in Jerusalem. And we see this for several, the, the several first chapters until chapter 6 where it becomes this sort of um, grown responsibility that requires additional offices. And we see in chapter 6 the first establishment of new offices for how they're supposed to be functioning as a church locally, as a body. And they establish in chapter 6 uh, what would be referred to as the office of a deacon. They uh, were trying to address uh, specific problems that were coming up with the, the widows, there were widows that weren't being taken care of, and, and the apostles said, we need to focus on prayer and ministry of the word, and it's not right for us to be serving tables. We, we ought to pick spirit-filled men, and the congregation picks them, and we appoint them to say, these are people who ought to be serving the needs of the church. And so they establish this new office, and we also see in chapter 11, uh, there's records of um, elders that are functioning in a leadership role. And really in chapter 11, you see the first mention of elders as a leadership role in the church that's being established. And then we also see in chapter 14, as we saw earlier, Paul and Barnabas are even implementing this model in their church planting. So they went through and planted churches and they came back through establishing a plurality of elders in every location. So we see that there's, there's these new offices of, 
uh, a pastor elder and deacons that are being established in these chapters. And then in chapter 15, we come to what's referred to as the Jerusalem Council. And there's this sort of uh, moment where you, you see this shared authority between apostles and elders. And they're getting together to study to God's word to answer a doctrinal question. That's a, that's a shepherding responsibility. And this sort of shared joint moment of authority helps us to see that there's sort of this baton passing that says, hey, apostles aren't going to be here forever. And they need to establish where the authority lies for the local church. And then we see by chapter 20 that Paul is is clearly communicating to the elders at Ephesus and establishing and commissioning them as the local sole authority for the church there. And that that's really the pattern that is set for the church moving forward. And we see that emphasized in the epistles and in the remaining writings of the New Testament as well. So let's look specifically at um, pastoral responsibilities. What does that look like? How does Scripture describe this pastor-elder term that's supposed to have authority in the local church? Well, we find in Scripture that there are really three descriptive titles for this singular office. The first, we would say, is, is the pastor-shepherd. The pastor-shepherd role is to be one who feeds and nourishes the flock through the teaching and preaching of the Word. They are to guide and direct them. They are also to protect them. This is a sort of Uh, speaking to the heart. It's a sincere care and love for the people whom they are specifically called to serve and uh, here locally in in their own congregation. And we see the scripture emphasizes that Christ is the chief shepherd and that he calls local pastors to be under shepherds or shepherding delegates of his local churches. We also see scripture describe this office as elder. That would refer to uh, one who has a strength of character. And we see that even established in the qualifications in 1 Timothy and in Titus. So this is one who is um, spiritually mature, one who is wise, and one who has moral integrity, being qualified and able to rule well over Christ's local church. We also see the office of um, overseer. You'll see this term in your study through scripture, um, which is that same word, episkopos, which um, other, uh, historically was translated bishop um, as an office. And so that's bishop, overseer. Those are synonymous. It comes from the same word, just different terms in our language to refer to that same uh, term. But it really is one who, who has a governing and ruling role over, over a group, and that one who administrates, one who leads and directs. Others, And so that's, that's what's tied into the term overseer when you see that in Scripture. And we understand at our church from, from Scripture that this, this pastor, elder, overseer is a trifold description of one office in the church. It's three descriptions of one role. And we see this in passages describing the duty of elders in Scripture. We see this um, sort of equivocation of pastor is elder, elder is overseer in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3. Scripture records for us, so I exhort the elders among you, shepherd the flock of God. That's, that's the same word for pastor. He's saying you need to pastor the flock. You need to shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercising, he says, oversight. That's that, it's the verb form of episkopos. It's, it's just saying bishop over them, oversee them. It's, it's the verb form. So he's not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. So we would see here that an elder is one who pastors and oversees. And so it seems like Scripture is tying those responsibilities together. We also see this um, term flock is closely tied with the idea of shepherding or pastoring as described in Acts 20 as well. Paul is commissioning the elders, plural, at Ephesus And he talks to them and says, after he called the elders of the church to come to him, he says and instructs them, pay careful careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. There's that shepherding, pastoring metaphor. And in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So the leaders that are these sort of shepherding elders that watch over the flock are assigned a specific congregation by God. And we find further description of this authority of the elders in in their church um, in the pastoral epistles. We see in 1 Timothy 5.17, Paul instructs to the young Timothy ministering in Ephesus, he says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So these were, were responsibilities that were tied to elders, that they were to rule well, 
and they were to preach and teach their primary responsibilities as an elder. Um, and if they excel in these responsibilities or one or the other of these responsibilities, they are to be esteemed highly by the church and even compensated and supported by the church. So Paul highlights the, the role of ruling and the role of proclaiming the, ministry, the proclaiming ministry of God's word. So if pastors or elders are to rule and lead in the local church, what then does scripture say is the role of the congregation? What do they do or how are they supposed to respond to this authority? Well, it seems like scripture emphasizes for us two specific things, that there is a submissive role and an active role. So first, the church is to be submissive to God's established leaders for them. And we see this in Hebrews 13. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you, he says. After, uh, additionally, Peter comments, After instructing elders to shepherd the flock in a non-dominating way, those who are under their local charge, he says in 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The congregation, it seems in Scripture, is, is responsible to humbly submit to their spiritual leaders who watch over and care for their souls. But that's not all that scripture says. It also says congregations are to be active. There is an active role. The church is to be submissive to God's established leaders and active with them in ministry for Christ. The local church has a responsibility and are to be involved in several ways according to scripture. We see that the church is responsible to do the work of the ministry. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about how Christ has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherds, and teachers, and he's given them to equip the saints so that they would do the work of the ministry, that they would build up the body of Christ. So there's an active participation in the mission, that they are to be equipped to do the ministry. They're also responsible, it seems in scripture, to select deacons for service. We see that in Acts chapter 6. The apostles uh, were telling, gathering the, the full number of the disciples and saying uh, that they ought to appoint um, and pick among them men of good repute, full of the spirit and full of wisdom, so that they can help serve the physical needs of the church. That was a responsibility that they wanted the church to say, hey, you know those among you that will do a good job in this role, this office, and we want you to be part of it. And then the apostles would appoint those who were selected. We also see that the church is involved in, uh, and responsible to honor leaders who labor for the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 5.12, it says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. This is a responsibility of the congregation and their active participation of how they relate to the authority that has been delegated in the local church. We also see that there's a responsibility to provide for their shepherds, as we saw in 1 Timothy 5, 17, referring to worthy of double honor. We also see that there is a responsibility to remove elders who fall into sin. Um, It says, do not admit a charge against an elder except when there's evidence of two or three witnesses. So it seems that there's, there's some sort of recourse to say, hey, there's qualifications in scriptures for these offices and leadership in the church. And that there is accountability to say, hey, Scripture says that you need to maintain those qualifications. It's not a once you're in a lifetime appointment, but that there's, a, there's a, a way in which sin ought to be addressed, even by the congregation toward those who are in authority over them. There's also a responsibility to follow the example of the faith of their leaders, described in Hebrews 13. To remember your leaders, those who spoke the word to you. It says to consider the outcome of their way of life and to imitate, it says, their faith. So the congregation is not passive, but is given responsibility to actively pursue. So a biblical summary, briefly before we get to questions, would be that the New Testament model for leadership is not this sort of elder rule government that has no congregational involvement, nor is it this congregational government with no pastoral oversight. It seems in Scripture that primarily it speaks of Christ, who is supreme, who is the head of his church, the chief shepherd, It speaks of elders who are to be godly leaders that are to shepherd, lead, and oversee the church with authority. That deacons are to be trusted servants who help meet the needs of the congregation. And that the congregation 
um, is to be engaged laborers in Christ's mission, that they are to minister, support, honor, and follow their leaders appointed by Christ and called by them and recognized by them. And that we also see that local churches are to have a plurality of pastors and elders that are governing over the well-being of Christ's body until he returns. So today we've really focused on the relationship between and the responsibilities of the pastor, elder, and the congregation. There are leaders and there are members, and there's some distinction between them, but there's this sort of interlocking roles that are observable in Scripture, and we want to and ought to uphold those functions as described in God's Word for the good of His church and for God's glory. So we find that there is both pastoral authority and there is congregational responsibility. So rather than a singular term or just saying plural, pastoral, congregational, polity view, we prefer to use the phrase elder-led and congregationally involved. We would say that our church is elder-led, according to Scripture, and that it is congregationally involved. It's not that the church just appoints a person once, and then they are representative, and they make all the decisions from there. But they are to lead. They have real authority. They make real decisions. But the involvement of the church is so important in regards to the unity and the glory of Christ. And so we want to make sure that we uphold both of those. So there is real leadership, rule, and accountability to God to oversee those under their care in the elders. But there's real active participation by the congregation seeking to humbly follow those who are over them in the Lord according to Scripture. So practically... What this looks like here is a pastor, elder, is a synonymous term, and they can be full-time, part-time, paid or unpaid um, here at Redemption Hill Church. Um, And though the ministry workload may be different, there's no difference in qualifications, um, and their their gifting may differ um, in regards to the gifts of the Spirit, but their authority is synonymous over the congregation. And the responsibility before God is the same. So we make sure that the church, like it may look different for J.D. and I in regards to how we're gifted and how we function um, locally. But we actually have shared authority. It is, it is the plurality of the elders that have a shared authority over the church. Currently we have uh, two full-time pastor elders, J.D. Summers and myself. And our aim and prayer is to see more pastors matured and grown here and called to shepherd here at Redemption Hill Church. We also see um, practically here uh, for our church as a congregation that the congregation votes on new deacons, new elders, and the adoption of budgets or any budgetary changes that happen at our church because we want the church to uh, be involved and aware of how Christ's mission is being deployed and going forth, um, even from a monetary standpoint. And we also see that the congregation has a responsibility to help hold the church's leadership accountable to biblical qualifications. Uh, Those are qualifications that we ought to maintain. And to help hold um, doesn't just mean that you nitpick everything, but you are part of our sanctification as well. And you also are laborers with us for Christ. And so we appreciate your prayers as well. That's part of helping and guarding the church is praying that there would not be disqualifying things that happen to elders that would would hinder Christ's church or even uh, a sheep in Christ's church. We also see that the congregation has a responsibility to help fellow church members to follow Christ. So uh, we don't see um, church discipline as something that that just happens at a pastoral level, but that first stage of uh, seeing sin and calling it out and addressing it is something that happens in a healthy church body, that we're helping one another grow in Christ's likeness together, and that there's layering to those steps that are involved, but we're to, to help one another, and that the church is supposed to be involved in that process. He says, tell that to the church, referring to the congregation. And so when, when sin needs to be addressed and it's persistent, um, it's something that the whole church is involved in in that process as we've seen and had to function um, here at our church body. And it's one that's a function that seeks reconciliation primarily as well. So those are some um, practical applications of what this church polity looks like here at our church. And I wanted to open it up for some questions, see if you guys uh, had any specific questions about how church polity works um, here at our church. Yeah, Pat. Yes. Yeah, we see that the biblical qualifications establish that it should be male leadership um, in, in the church. So that's a great point. Um, and scripture speaks to that pretty clearly. Not in the pastor elder role. And specifically here, there are some churches that we are like 98, 99% in agreement with that they, they would see that there's some, there some wiggle room for um, women to serve as a deacon um, as servants in the church, uh, but we currently don't. We see that those qualifications are, 
are paralleled with the qualifications of an elder overseer in First Timothy. And so we, we would say that that ought to be um, men that are serving and functioning in that role as well. And that the deacon qualifications even talk about the spouse, how, how, how the wife's character should be for a, for a man to be qualified as a, a, to serve as a deacon in the church. What's the women's role is your question. Yeah, women are to be faithful laborers for Christ that serve and use their gifts deploying for God's glory. So there's no, there's no diminishing. Um, it's just Christ has established an authority structure. And he says in Scripture that that's, that's not rooted in anything sort of culturally. Uh, but those passages of Scripture actually root it to Genesis pre-fall. And say that that's part of God's authority structure. And so this is for, for God's glory and our good. And so we want to delight and embrace that and say, this is, this is God's good design. And so we do embrace that. I know you do as well. And those are good questions for us to talk through. Like we, we see these texts of scripture that tell us that they're supposed to be male leadership. And next week we'll even say, what do we mean by headship? What is scripture um, talking about when it says this word to be the head? And who is the head um, in different um, governing structures, um, even in a family? Um, and that Christ establishes the head of the church too, so... Yep, yep, exactly, yep, great. Yes, Andrew. Yeah, great question. So what, he, the question was, what happens to, uh, what's the process for a pastor if he becomes unqualified? So scripture says to not submit a charge against an elder except for two or three witnesses. Um, so there's some protection that it's not going to be this sort of nitpicky, I don't like the pastor um, situation, um, which we're grateful for. Um, but that doesn't mean that pastors are perfect. Like, we're not sinless beings that walk among you. Like, it's not, that's not what Scripture tells us we ought to do. And we ought not to have that complex. Um, but we ought to be those who are submitted humbly to Scripture to say, if, if there are, are those who see a pattern in my life amongst the flock who I am, I ought to smell like the sheep because I am a sheep and I ought to be among you. And so um, if there's sin in my life, I ought to have an attitude that invites correction, that humbly receives it, and that sees my sin like Scripture describes it and turns from it. But as, as a leader, as a pastor, if I'm, if I'm not in that, um, if I'm not humbly submitted and confessing my sin, I'm, I'm disqualified as an elder. So what that looks like is that there would be um, two or three witnesses that testify to it. And specifically in that passage, it even continues that um, there, there ought to not be a persisting in sin. So if, if there's a persistence in an elder to say, no, this isn't wrong, this isn't sin, um, that's when it would be something that would be addressed in the church um, discipline progress. So you're already at step two because there's, there's two or three witnesses and there would be other um, elder pastors in a plurality involved to say, hey, I, we need to make sure and care for our brother here. And if there's no returning, um, they would be removed from their office and then fellowship would be distanced for the purpose of them seeing that you, you're not following Christ, you're not submitted to Christ and his authority and you're walking in sin and there's, there's no evidence of, of saving faith because Saving faith looks like submitted obedience to Christ's rule and authority and commands. So that would be generally the process, um, if that, that helps. Yes, Zach. So if you look over our Roman Catholic friends, we see that they have had a lineage of the deacon Peter as the originating head of the church body. Mm-hmm. Where do you think that comes from in the scripture or tradition, and what leads us away from that type of conclusion? Yeah, so the question is, uh, Roman Catholics seem to have this um, ecclesiastical hierarchical structure um, rooted back to Peter. Um, so where do they see that, and, and where, where are we differing um, is sort of the question. So um, they root it in texts where Jesus is speaking to Peter and says, uh, upon this rock I will build my church. Um, and, and so they'll say that there's a, a delegation of specifically a, a papal type of, type of authority, and that that papal authority has... Uh, 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 unbroken chain connecting um, them all the way down. So we would say there, there is a, a, um, a structure that Christ has established, but the structure is Christ, his 12 apostles, which we have their witness and testimony, that is authority, and then they delegated to elders to locally rule. So we would look at the books of Acts and say, hey, this is what the apostles did. They established local leadership that is submitted to God's word and Christ's authority that's delegated. Um, but even in Revelation, you see that there's a position for the apostles um, that's unique and authoritative. 
And so I, I wouldn't try to demote them or equivocate elders with them, but just would say there is an apostolic authority that's unique, um, and that some ties into what J.D. talked about last week, what we mean by cessationists. There is a, a ceasing of either apostolic gifts or even apostolic authority um, in the sense that there's no present embodiment of that, but we have the scriptures uh, that Christ's spirit uniquely inspired them to give that sort of apostolic authority today that we are to study and to implement for the benefit of Christ's church. So we differ in that sense that we're seeing that, yeah, there was a unique authority there, but it's not, there's no continuation of apostolic authority and so that's where we differ, and then we, we would become less interdependent or interconnected, um, saying that there's local authority outside the church because we have Christ, we have the apostles' testimony, um, and then the next layer would be local um, elder-led authority. So, good question. Yes, Joe? Yeah, so the question is about um, church history and um, that's impact in regards to our, our view. And in studying for this, I wanted to understand more of uh, other views of church polity and uh, much of the Episcopalian argument in regard, not argument in a bad way, but uh, their logical deduction is less inference from texts of scripture and more church history. And I don't think church history is um, invalid or unimportant. Uh, but it does have a, a subservient role um, to the authority of Scripture. But they would say that, hey, there's, there's a pattern here of a plurality in regards to um, a, a, an interconnected structure of authority, and that that ought to have influence into, in regards to how we, we establish it. But what we don't have is Scripture saying, hey, Paul's instructing how to deal with church discipline, and he doesn't say to the church at Corinth, he doesn't say, hey, next time something comes up, write me a letter because I need to tell you how to deal with it. He says, there's sin, you deal with it, you need to address it, and it's wrong, you ought to be embarrassed that you don't deal with it. And so I think there's, there's an establishment in multiple epistles where there's local authority that's dealing with those issues rather than a sort of hierarchical structure apart from apostles. And that's where we set apostles as unique. Um, rather than inferring from how um, a Jewish history dealt with elders, Paul's using that terminology, but it seems like he's implementing it in a, in a different way rather than connecting it together. So, yeah, follow-up question. Yeah, so your question is about 6,000 years of history and in elder structures. Yeah, the, the difficulty is the church hasn't been around for 6,000 years. Um, so, so my view would be that there's, there's differences in regards to how those structures were established. Um, but there are Presbyterians that go to the Moses model. And they'll say, hey, this is similar to the church. And they would see a continuation there that we don't. Um, but there are, there's elder plurality rule with a singular head in Moses that's, that was established. Um, and so some will use that into implementing into their church polity. But again, those are, those are inferences that are different than in specific instructions to the New Testament church. Um, but you're asking me to grade it. I, I mean, my, my view would be that it's, it's less than ideal, but not sin. They're seeking to honor Christ in the best way they can. Um, but I think that it's good to have plurality. It's good to have communion with other saints and other churches. I just don't see an interconnecting governing authority um, so I, I, I fall short of probably being able to grade it um, in a specific way, um, but that would be my, my two cents on it, if that helps. Yes, Jared. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're asking about the process of bringing on a new shepherding elder. What does that look like here at our church? Um, there's always a pursuit of leadership development. Um, we're supposed to and commissioned um, to pass on to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so part of that is saying, how are we intentionally as leaders pursuing leadership development um, and pastoral qualifications in, amongst men who are rising up as leaders in our church? 
but also that's something that's recognized by the congregation. So we've received letters from church members. We've had conversations with church members saying, hey, this is someone who looks like um, they would be fitting for the qualifications. Are they on your radar? Are they, are they being invested in? Are they being developed and grown for that pursuit? Um, and usually we have a conversation of, is there a personal call? Is there a sort of personal conviction um, that leads them to desire the office of an overseer, Scripture says? Um, is there a congregational observation that, yeah, this guy's qualified. It's not a sort of like self-exaltation of, I think I ought to be a pastor. But it's like, no, he has the shepherding heart. He's viewed that way amongst our flock. And so there is this sort of um, organic process that starts, and then it becomes a, a specific process of leadership development and saying, hey, is there um, qualifications being met? Is there doctrinal alignment? Um, because a, as a mission, as a church, if we're not doctrinally aligned, there has to be um, a, a full agreement between the essentials and distinctives in our church um, governing documents um, that's included in our Constitution, our Statement of Faith. If there's not a full agreement there, then there needs to be some more teaching and instruction, some discipleship that happens to say, how do we get to, from point A to point B? Um, but our desire is to see that process continue in regards to leadership development. And that's usually a lot of discipleship that J.D. and I are involved in. Um, but we're always kind of like asking the congregation, how do you, how, how do you view this person? Um, deacons is not like a stepping stone necessarily to an elder, but because there's qualifications that are observed by the congregation, that's a good pool to look at for leadership development because the congregation has already said, this guy is spiritually mature. Um, so we want to look and say, okay, the difference between a deacon and an elder would be that they're able to teach. Um, and so that's, that's one of the, the big um, differences is that there's an ability um, that scripture requires of, of an elder overseer. So... Um, Hopefully that helps, but we would love more, past, uh, more, more input from the congregation in that respect. There's men that you recognize that like, hey, this, this guy seems to have that sort of shepherding, passionate uh, zeal for the word and for this church, that there's a love for this church uh, locally, um, and that there seems to be gifting and calling. I've talked to him. He's excited about that opportunity. How is this being grown and matured um, and pursued um, so that there can be a calling? Scripture also says, uh, I'll give this as kind of a final note, it's interesting when you compare Acts to the pastoral epistles, what you see is Paul's kind of like sprinting through, planting churches, churches are planted without elders, I mean really that's what happens, um, and it's funny when to think about, but uh, an elder is technically a non-essential position for a church, um, the church was started without them, and then he goes back and saying it's really the well-being of a church that benefits from good godly leadership. And so the church is the gathering of the believers, um, but for the health of the church, there should be uh, local leadership involved. And, and then what you see in the pastoral epistles is you see him saying, don't be too quick to lay on hands. Uh, I, I think there was some, some aged wisdom there that says, hey, we were footloose and fancy free, and we were, we were doing as Christ commanded, spreading the gospel, dealing with a growing church and establishing it. Uh, but don't be too quick in that process, because it's an important one, and to be... Uh, prayerfully considering men who are, who are um, growing and maturing into that role and, and that they would be called by God and that it would be evident to his church and evident to the existing leadership as well. So with that, we'll be done and you're dismissed and look forward to worshiping with you here at 1030.